We're going to go ahead and get started because Charlene is a busy lady and she's got one more event after this one today. So I would like to introduce my long-term friend, long-term friend, Charlene Marshall. I met Charlene uh, when Gwendolyn, Charlene's daughter, was in social work school at WDU. <laughs> <laughs> we met the set up back there and we'll see if get out of the way to I met Charlene in 1972 when her daughter uh, Gwendolyn was a student in the social work school at WVU and I was a student in the same program. We used to ride the bus from downtown, from the campus down over to uh, Greenmont where we both lived. So since that time, Charlene has traveled a long road and she's accomplished a great deal of things. So I'd like to introduce you today, Charlene Marshall. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for coming out in this weather today. I'm just glad it's not snowing. And sometimes I would tell them um, when I when we put this project together, I told some of these ladies that uh, or a book club men in a book club that I belong, I said, nobody knows. Uh -huh. So I'm surprised today to see some of you who were there in November and you came back and did it today. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I want to do also, and I don't, cause I don't want you to forget, uh, I have a dear friend uh, that's here today that's new to Morgan Town, and her name is Misha Poor. And Misha has just completed one week, her first week at the university. She's vice president of diversity, and I think there's some other things that goes along with that title. <laughs> an attorney and she uh, served with me, uh, I think I had been in the legislature four years and then uh, all of a sudden there was Misha Moore from Thompson. <laughs> so Misha is quite active and just glad to have her here at work now and I didn't want to forget to introduce her. Now I'll explain to you what I have here. Uh, I belong to a book club and so many times we would be discussing books that had to do with African Americans and I would tell the people in the club. This reminds me of something that happened in Morgan County a few years ago. And they reminded me that they were on, they only came to Morgan County as adults to uh, they were professors at the university. And they said, Sure, I to do something and for all. And I thought, oh I can't do something for three or four weeks like a class. So I decided after this discussion, I thought, okay, I'll do something and we'll do it one time. I never, and I said, probably no one's going to come and listen to it. No way. Well, we did it for Ollie on November the 8th, and we had 80 uh, individuals to come, and I see some of those in return today. And they let me know how much they appreciated this, and since then, I've had a number of requests to show this over again. So I sent up the email to, to a number of different people. So uh, we, uh, Dr. Barkow helped me with the PowerPoint. And as you go through, you'll see some photos of me uh, in second and third grade and so forth, and some photos of children who went to school out in those things. But I basically was trying to put together something that showed you, uh, would, would let people know what happened before integration and the number of slot schools that were circulated throughout Montgomery County. And uh, a lot of people did not realize how many we had. So that's what basically this is about. This tells you something about the population in the area. So we can so we can that right? Uh, and this tells us too, as you can see about the early African American schools and what happened when we were, you know, trying to get to, to uh, schools started throughout the area. This is um, this tells us about the first, that you see, first organized black school in uh, Montgomery County. And we talk about some of the churches here. There's still a Jones uh, Episcopal Church. And it, it used to be on Chestnut Street, and now it's on Green Street. So we talk a little bit also about the, uh, uh, the churches here in Morgan County. And as you can see, of course, you see where the first teacher was getting $25 a month. So. Uh, well, I guess we made some improvements, but I guess some of the teachers are out there on strike and think, well, we haven't gone too far. <laughs> 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 uh, 
And this is the layout of some of the, uh, uh, the streets in Oregon. You see, some of the streets, of course, have different. They they wrote some of the names around, and some of the streets are a little bit different. Um, we had, uh, as you see, Bill Jacobs, that was a family that was here many years ago, as you can see, and was a teacher there. Uh, Alexander Wade uh, contributed a lot to the education system here in Montgomery County. And those of you who are more familiar with Warner Town South High Street, when you go across that bridge and make that first left, <coughs> way back up in there, there's a great big house, and everybody refers to it as the Wade House. That was the house that, uh, that Dr. Wade and his family lived in for many years. And then as we get on down further, I, well, I, I think maybe we took the picture out of this house, but as uh, uh, high school students, I, that was one of my first jobs. I would work there for the family after school because I always wanted to have a job and there wasn't, wasn't jobs around for African Americans. So that was one of the places that I worked. Not maybe two, but I was there, but I did work there. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, this is uh, it's just a Professor Wade. I, I think Wade, he wanted to be a doctor. And as I said, he contributed and, and, uh, uh, a lot to the education system here, and I think probably even nationally. This is uh, uh, the building that they refer to as a little bit of a schoolhouse down on Beechurch Avenue. And it's a shame that maybe they didn't move this to another place, but this is what the one of the first only two schools for African American uh, children in Morgantown. And as you see, it uh, was probably close to St. Paul, right by the Phil House. And uh, I know I need to do some more research on this because I think once it was no longer used by African Americans, I think it became a sort of laboratory for some of the children whose parents were at the university. And this if you can, I, I, of course, I was never in it. I don't know how large it was, but this is a picture of some of the students who went to a little bit of schoolhouse. And um, I'm, I'm just sorry that I didn't get more information because I, there's a lady who passed away about four years ago, and I do believe she's in this picture. She, uh, she often used to talk about the little bit of schoolhouse. Um, the, there, was a, there was a school up in Jerome Park that was built for African American students, and the, as you see, the Board of Education voted to close that school. And uh, during some of my research, although they voted in 1929, they did not close that school. And uh, I'll have a photo of the school later. The building is still in existence up, up, up uh, above uh, uh, Jerome Park. It's at the corner of uh, Jerome Street, and I forget yeah, there's another street up there, but anyway, they didn't close it. And when I was putting this together and someone discussed it, they said, no, they closed it. I said, no, they didn't close it because I talked to some of the people who went to school there, and they know that they went to school there until uh, 1950. Well, the school did not close until 1954. As they went through the sixth grade, to the sixth grade, they would go to Martin Gilly High School. And Monday High School, of course, was a school that was for all African American students that lived in Monday County. So they didn't go to school there. Um, and then on White Avenue, you will see further down, there was, uh, there's a building there that was used for the high school, and I'll be showing that to you in a little bit. Uh, this is I know a lot of people want to know what happened. Usually we talk about Beecher's uh, elementary and the schools for African American children, but they refer to the school right on Beecher's Avenue, and that's down not too far from where the Avenue Church is today. Um, but the school was down there, and then they evidently had both in there, uh, grade school and high school, but they later moved this to White Avenue, and this just gives you an idea of some of the people who were uh, there, who were the instructors. Ms. Mildred Henshaw, uh, it says, as principal, Mrs. Henshaw was uh, someone who was uh, a native of Morgan Town, and she still has relatives that live here even today. Uh, Goldie Hepburn was a uh, the principal, and I think her husband was one of the 
probably the only African American uh, medical doctor that I knew that lived here in Morgantown. As you see here, that is the uh, school up in Jerome Park. And as I said, we took this picture in October. And uh, the Board of Education evidently sold it. And there's a family that makes their home there today. Yet at Central and Jerome Street. I couldn't think of Central a few minutes ago. So uh, this is just a sort of an area view uh, to tell you where that is. Uh, as you can see, it was uh, a one-room school. And there's people uh, probably close to my age who are out in Jerome Park today, and I can talk to them about this school building. And of course, that's where they walk up over the hill. You go up above Ridgewood Avenue, up above the Dairy Mart, and this school, this building is still in existence. Mm -hmm. John Hunt Ice Cream. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I know that Ron Rittenhouse has done a lot of history about John Hutton. He, John Hutton, he knows a lot of things about him. But this is Mr. Hunt, and this building was located at the corner of Beechers and Hunt Street. And Hunt Street is the only street that I know of in Morgantown that's named for an African American. Um, it was right beside Colson Hall. And it used to go from University Avenue down to Beechers Avenue before they built Brook Hall. That took out part of that street, so it's now a dead end street. Mr. Hutt had an ice cream factory down there, and he made ice cream called the Hokey Pokey Ice Cream. <laughs> and they said he would go around with his horse and buggy and haul her down the ice cream. And he, uh, ev he was evidently a man that was beyond his time. He was a millionaire, I think, twice. Wow. And uh, he had the school had the top part of this building for a high school. And they stayed there until the students, it was no longer room for them there. But he was quite a, a gentleman. He had many restaurants throughout Morgantown. And he really, really pushed for education and so forth for all. And, um, and it was just to me ironic that he did so much. He evidently passed away in the early 30s. And with all the work that he did, it's just something to me that his granddaughter, who was my best friend in high school, became the first African-American female to graduate West Virginia University after integration. And uh, she graduated high school with me, and then she went to West Virginia State because we were still not allowed to enter WVU as freshmen. And she had been there for two years with Brown versus Board of Education, and she came back to Morgantown. And it was simply because I thought she lived within a stone's throw of the university, but she couldn't go. So she came back the last two years, and then she graduated at the U. But there's a lot to be said about John Hunt. Roscoe Clarkson was the first um, principal of a, of a high school here, and he was at the uh, Beecher's High. And his daughter, Naomi Parson, is just someone that I wish that I had spent more time talking with her because Naomi just knew so much history about everything. But Mr. Parson um, was a principal evidently for a number of years. I can remember him in his later years with things that he left the school system because <coughs> he wasn't making enough money and he started his own business. And as you see there, he passed away in 1952. Arthur Barnett was quite a, just quite a person. He um, was in Morgantown for a number of years. Recently, I was reading an article about one of the ladies that was in uh, Hidden Figures, and her name was Dorothy Vaughn. And Dorothy Vaughn, her family came to Morgantown because uh, Mr. Hunt recruited her parents to come here from Kansas. And Dorothy Vaughn was, um, was a student at, well, at Beecher's High, and she left here at the time when she got a, 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 she got a scholarship to Wilberforce. And I'm reading about Dorothy Vaughn, and at the end of it, here was a letter of recommendation. And it was signed by Arthur Barnett, and I was just stunned. 
he was my principal in 1950s. And I thought, how long was he there? And he signed that in 1923. But it's something because you know how we talk about things going in a circle. He knew Dorothy Vaughn as a student, but he also knew Katherine Johnson because Katherine Johnson taught at Montgomery High in 1940 for one year. But I had the opportunity to meet her last year down at Greenbrier for her birthday, and, and she was uh, 99 years old. She spoke of living with her principal when she was in Morgantown, and I used to wonder well, who was her principal. Well, it was Arthur Barnett, so he knew Dorothy Vaughn, and he also knew Katherine Johnson. So the house that Katherine lived in is on Richwood Avenue. So I just thought, I, I was just so surprised that he had been around that long. Of course, we thought he had when we were in school. <laughs> I read that paper in proof. <laughs> This, uh, as you say, football team, um, and a lot of times we talk, you'll we'll hear us talk about the uh, Edwards on Friday Avenue, and there's just so many things neat about this. Over here we see on the far end, uh, John Edwards, who was the principal. In the center, the captain holding the, the football, that is, uh, one of his younger brothers was uh, another Edwards right there. John is over here, he is the captain. Um, so there's so many people here that I can I, I can look at and I can just remember. Also, a gentleman from Osage right here was Alfred Jones, who lived to be 101 years old and he passed away about just a very couple of years ago. But this was, as you see, the type uniforms they had, whatever they could get. And this was uh, the football team from from that was. This is the Edwards house, and we'll see another photo of it later. But they evidently changed the front of this house so many times. This is the house when the high school moved from Beechurst Avenue to White Avenue. They went to this school, and uh, J.E.G. Edwards moved his family out of this house to an adjoining house that he had. He had, an, in, uh, he had a lot of property, and they moved in there, and this was a high school. One of the things that I always find so interesting about this, one, the youngest son, his name was Dixon Edwards, and Dixon lived here in Morgantown. Yeah. I, I think maybe he passed away about nine or ten years ago. But he always said when his dad moved him out of that house, and the high school was there, he said all of a sudden his home room was a room he was born in, and his home, and his home room teacher was his brother. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's another shot of the house, but we'll see another one because just recently someone purchased this house and it has been remodeled again and it looks good. But I think the house has probably 27 or 30 rooms or so, but that is a house that at one time was. Well, uh, this is just an aerial view of all of us that we tried to put some things together for some of the people that we were able to point some uh, points out. This gives us a shot of some of the different places that we had uh, elementary schools that we taught. We go up to one here in Jerome Park, and there's the Beechers Elementary, Montgomery High School. Um, so this was just an aerial view of how they were and how they were laid out. And then, of course, back over here to Dwight Avenue. Up at uh, Osage, and because I've covered all the schools in Montgomery County, my first grade, I went to a one-room school in Kersler, and there was two buildings up there. One went one first to third, and the other went fourth to sixth, and there was two buildings there. And then over at Cassville, there was a house there, a, a building, put up by the coal company, and it was a, uh, they had several grades in there for uh, African-American students. I was talking to a gentleman just a couple of days ago, he's 94 years old, and he went to school up there in Castro. Um, and then there was another school, I uh, can't see Chapman over there, there was, a, there was also a school for elementary students, African-American, at Chaplin, and also one at Bertha Hill. So when you think about all the schools they had, that tells us that at some point we had a lot more African Americans down here than we had than we had now. The one at Osage, uh, I, like I said, I went to first class for a while, for one semester, and then the second semester of that year, a school was built at Osage that took all of the African American students in 
from uh, all over. So um, it just seems to me that so many times when the Board of Education opens up, opens up a new school, it doesn't open until the second semester. So that's what happened when I was, was a kid. So we had them all over. And I think even the, the students in Westover had to go to um, uh, Jerome Park, where they had to travel different places to get to the school. Okay, so. This is another shot of the different places that they had the schools. And uh, up at uh, Bertha, so many people refer to that as Randall. Then there was a chaplain school, Osage, First Club, Liberty, and then the one at Castle. I think the students from Shriver and Jerry, and I hardly hear everyone speak of Shriver right now, but all these were small coal companies, and almost every one of them, there was a coal company that had their own coal mines there. So, and that went all the way up through, uh, through uh, Osage. Well, we've already covered the woods outside of the, uh, yeah, so on. Okay, and then here it just tells you the schools in red uh, were the only ones that not go to Fort Lee Cross. Some of these kids, these were the others, the children from other places that went, uh, other than the school in Osage. When the school in Osage was built, the superintendent of schools was Floyd B. Cox, and of course our school became known as Floyd B. Cox School. Castle Newville, the one room school, that building is still in existence. After a number of years, uh, when the coal company was going to sell it and quite a bit of property went with it, my aunt and her husband bought that and turned it into a home. And then when she was getting up in years and she decided she didn't want to have a home anymore, she sold it and someone has made a beautiful uh, home out of that. As I said, the one in Joe Park is still in existence, so that all of the others are gone. The one at Crown, uh, it is still in existence and it's just fully covered with weeds, and it looks like it's a good structure, but um, it's kind of hard to get to it. And then, of course, the one, the second board, and we'll talk about that one in a little bit. Okay. And this just shows you where the one was at Berkeley Hill. Thank you. So many people will tell me that the one on Berkeley Hill is still there. There is a school up there, but it sets farther back, and it is not the one that I remember. I don't know how I happened to get, I guess my mother wanted to get me out of the house. Probably because I was talking too much because I didn't go to school with the kids before I was old enough to go. But I remember going to school with my oldest sister when we went to Bertha Hill. And it was right at the top of the hill was a one-room school. And there evidently is another one that's farther back on the hill. But then for some reason I also remember going to Chaplin. And the teacher that was there, her name was Beulah Cobbs. Ironically enough, uh, Mrs. Cobbs also taught my mother in school, and then she taught all of us uh, seven kids in my family. And uh, she would uh, tell me that I was too little to to play with the other kids, and she'd keep me in to take a nap with her. I said, today that would not happen when you put the kids out to, out to the playground. But that's what we're, that's, that was up at Bertha. Uh, uh, I went to Bertha, and I went to Chaplin also. And this was Cha and Chaplin, and to find that school right there where the, um, I think they do a cement thing there, as you go up the road to Ballon Park. And of course all of that has been done over again up there with all the uh, construction and so forth. It's hard to tell exactly where that school was. I probably know the exact location, but it was a one-room school. And um, one time I was talking to somebody from the Board of Education and said something. And he said, you know what, I don't think we even have that list. And I said, I know it was there. We <laughs> had a lot of people around here, uh, African Americans would remember it, but uh, so somehow it may, it may have gotten lost in the shuffle that they owned the property. And at New Hill, this is the one that I was telling you about. It's uh, just at the top of the hill, when you go up and over to your left, there's a ballpark there, and that was what that school looked like at the time. When the coal company sold it, there was a lot of property with it. There's even there's a cemetery beside it. And um, I, I, I had no idea how much property, but I knew it of that when my aunt made that purchase seven years later when they were putting a golf course up there. She sold part of that property to the golf course. When I go up now to visit the people that live there, it's hard for me to determine 
what part was new and where the old part was, because they did such a terrific job. But this is the ball field that's there, and uh, it, it, it's used by the people there in that community. Edwardsville, like I told you, that building is still there, and uh, I'm surprised that someone hasn't bought that. Because I think about the time the school that Osage, Edwardsville, and probably the one on White Avenue was built, and they were all uh, looked like really strong brick buildings. So, uh, it, but it, it is still there. But I think the Woodward Station still owns Apple. Um, <laughs> in some of the work that I found, this lady talks about these the school at Evansville and uh, how, you know, the condition of it. And I also read where uh, the principal out there, when they got the property, um, they managed to get along with the teachers, I guess, at the high schools because they each had something on each side of the road that the other wanted and they traded off in some instances. So they, they did get along. This is a school at Second Ward. This is the one that's up on uh, White Avenue. I know my husband was the first grade there. And just recently, another person has purchased this building, and she has turned it into seven one-room studio apartments. And I was able to tour that last summer. And she really did a, a great job with the way that she has remodeled it. She did see that all, uh, all paved all the way around the school, and uh, it's just amazing the way that she did that. And as you can see, it was funded by the WPA, and um, it's uh, still in existence. The building is still there. Again, that's a shot of the school in the in the in front, but it doesn't look like that now. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I forgot this was even in there. <laughs> and it talks about me going to the school, I told you. And for the longest time, I was trying to find Stuck Town as I grew older. I thought, where is Stuck Town? And then I realized that they were talking about Post Club. So um, this was, uh, and I remember the teachers there. There was a Mrs. Earl and a Mrs. Uh, uh, Rush. And they, and then of course later they came to the school at Osage. So um, it was just quite interesting to know that uh, those two schools existed, and there's a lot of people that don't really realize that, and they will argue up and down that they never existed, but I went there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is, this is, and where we have those two uh, signs, those blue dots there, that is where off of the highway that um, the schools were located. And uh, I, I, I know that, <laughs> but I know to try to try to get up there now and wherever the um, the schools were, that houses have been put in there now, and it's um, almost impossible to see where that would be located at. Now. <laughs> This is my first grade class at Stout Count. <coughs> and when we were looking at these on a laptop, and I, oh, and, and probably the first time I saw this picture as an adult, uh, and we were getting ready for a high school reunion, and people were bringing in photos, and I told them, I said, I remember every one of those kids. I said, well, boy, the one's that kid right there. And they said, well, it's you. <laughs> I did not recognize myself. And, but sadly to say, I, and of course the one little girl, I still don't know who that is. And sadly to say, and I guess I've been blessed, as far as I know, all of them are deceased. Mm -hmm. um, they moved, moved away, um, some, the most of them did move away. And probably a lot of people who uh, knew, uh, let's see, John Boyd, as you see right there, it was a, a Pastor John Boyd that had church out in Osage. Well, he, he was in my first grade. So, that's, but I did not know. And, and I think the first time someone said, well, that's you. And I guess I had my hand. I didn't realize I'd do this when I'm tired. And I thought, that looks like that kid has a cat in her. And I wouldn't have a cat. <laughs> but, same to me. Okay. Um, and of course, that is a that's a uh, picture of our principal, Cody Cock. 
because, and he was, um, he was a superintendent in Longay County, as you see, for a number of years. And I know that he would come to our school many times. And uh, the other day I was looking at a picture someplace and they were proud to know that the uh, Board of Education or the state had passed a law in a couple of states that you have religious classes in school now. And I thought, that was a given for us. We always had uh, Bible studies on Thursday and the Presbyterian Church would bring the students out and we had workbooks and so forth. And, uh, but, uh, and sometimes uh, the superintendent would be there also. This one here is the new school that I told you about when they built it in uh, uh, Osage. It was up on top of the hill where the top arrow is. And any of you who are familiar with going out to Osage after you pass Sheets and you go across that bridge, when you go through that mountain, that mountain, the top of that mountain, that was our school. And I can remember when we were playing baseball and our teacher would say, there's the wooden stakes out there, do not remove them. There's going to be a road come through here. And we thought, why would a road go across that hill? And this, one of the stakes was right in front of her stakes. And we would pick it up and throw it over the hill. <laughs> Man, there's always somebody after lunch would tell, so it took the place. You had to go back and put it up. And that's, they, then when they built the road, they moved the school down to here for us. And uh, that school was there for a number of years. Even after 1954, but after integration, someone or somehow that building was torched. Mm -hmm. And uh, but when you go, every time I go through there, I think we went to school up on top of that hill. That road wasn't there, so anywhere you would go to get any further than Osage, you had to go through Osage, and now you go around it. So that's just to talk about again about the four big hospitals, the new site and the past district, and you can see where the you know it just it, it just amazes me that um, and some people will say well what was there before the bridge well uh, there was another old road the way that we could drive up on that school ground and they took all of that out. Okay. That just shows you again where the road. Is. <coughs> Thank you. This year, well, also in back of that school that we had up there, we had a separate kitchen, and that's where we would go for lunch. And uh, the two ladies in the front were uh, the cooks. This was uh, Mrs. Lucas and Mrs. Ross, and that was her son, and this was uh, Mrs. Ross's daughter. And uh, they, they gave us a hot lunch every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, this is uh, students, the kids that I went to school with. Um, and again, as far as I know, they're all students. Um, this young man here lived in Jerome Park for a while. And I know this one lived at Osage for a long time. And the others just moved away. And uh, they're, as far as I know, all deceased. And again, I had to find myself right there. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think my daughter said, who we were looking for, I said, I know those kids, but I don't see that and tell all of them. So I started making her. She says, Mom, is that you? <laughs> so, um, but I, these are just some of it. And probably for a uh, assembly, there was uh, two rooms, and uh, you, well, what the school had four rooms, but you would open the sliding doors, and they would make um, one large auditorium there. And this evidently was for one of those. But we did have some behind. These guys would all sing uh, in, the, they had choir. And these were some other kids that I went to school with. Again, I think the one on the far end there is, again, is uh, John Boyd, who later became a minister here. This was probably. Uh, just a class, and sometimes they would come to teach uh, the Bible school or do things. And Mrs. Richard Smith, as you see over there, it says she was a, uh, the wife of the director of the shop, and uh, Reverend Smith. And 
they would come and just have different classes with us, usually on a Thursday. This was just, and, and we just made it up the one lady there. She has a, a niece that's very active and uh, popular around Morgantown. She's an evangelist and also does a lot of saving for the university. And her name is Shirley Robinson. Well, this little snowball just happened to be her aunt, and we just made note of that. So some of the people that moved away, they uh, they still have a lot of relatives around here. This gentleman here, um, I probably, I think I met him when he was uh, 102 years old. Dewey Fox. Dewey Fox was just had to have been an incredible person a long time ago, and it says here became first president of NAACP. Dewey was one of the people who fought very hard for improvements uh, for African American students in Monday County, and he thought they needed a better school because the one on White Avenue was too crowded, and he referred to it as a fire hazard. And uh, I said, oh, I would be standing on his side if he were here today. He, if, I, I guess he had so many people to fight. Not, uh, not just because of racial, but also African Americans. I guess uh, it seems as if he fought with uh, Mr. Edwards because Mr. Edwards wanted to keep the school there and Joy thought it should be moved someplace else. And uh, then he had to fight with uh, residents of uh, Westover, because of the Board of Education, purchased that property over there. They had, uh, they fought against that. They didn't want the African American students to be in that location. Then he had to fight with the Ku Klux Klan, so and he was just not very tall. But he evidently stood his ground. I read one article where it says that uh, as a result of the harassment from the Ku Klux Klan, his, uh, I think his second wife left him and divorced. But uh, he always stood his ground. He lived to be 104 years old. And was, but the time that I met him, I, I just couldn't believe his age, and he was so knowledgeable. He's also the, the person who uh, helped um, the, uh, Dorothy Bond from Hidden Figures to receive her scholarship to Wilberforce, and also in the article that I said that Mr. Barnett read, wrote, Dewey Fox was uh, mentioned in that also. And Dewey was a member at uh, St. Paul Amy Church. The church still exists down on uh, Beach Church Avenue. But he was evidently quite a fighter. And in his later years, of course, he left Morgantown, um, he went to Fairmont. And I had not met him at the time, but I knew he was up in age. He ran for a uh, magistrate and won his one in, in Marion County. Yeah. He, he, he was just quite a person. He, uh, he, he, well, he definitely argued for that school. He wrote to President Roosevelt. He wrote to your congressman. He, he wasn't going to rest until then. I think he wrote to uh, Eleanor Roosevelt so much, they became good friends. <laughs> and they were, so, and we'll see here, I don't want to forget to mention now, I might repeat it, but when the Montague High School was, uh, um, when they dedicated the school, Mrs. Roosevelt came for that, and they had planned for him to meet her. Well, for some reason, I guess he must have said he was kind of busy that day. <laughs> but Mrs. Roosevelt went to Edwardsville to meet with him. So, uh, and those of you who know Edwardsville, it's right out, it's farther outside of town. But she went out to meet with, uh, with, with Dewey Fox. But, so he had to be quite a person. This was one of the articles when the WPA had the money to build the new high school. And um, some of the things that they put in there, and when I went back and read some of that later, uh, they talked about the field that was going to be over there and so forth. I thought, well, they got ahead of themselves because they did not complete that field. The high school always used <coughs> Morgantown High's football field for games and so forth. And uh, so it's, well, it's just a playground now for the uh, head, uh, yeah, for children over there. But um, this was just one of the forerunners when they first got the money to go to school. That is one Dunn High School, and that is a recent photo. I think maybe, I don't know if Ron took that photo or not, possibly, but, uh, and that was in later years. When the school closed in 1954, those houses and so forth were not there. 
no one would build a house out in the area as long as it was a school for African American students. So those things, and that, that's how I always know that that's a more re after 54, that, that that picture was, you know, was there. But that is the school, and it still looks the very same way today. Someone contacted me recently, and they wanted to really do an article about mine the other half, but they wanted a more recent picture, and they asked me, was that the flat part, was that a new addition? I thought, nope, that's what's always been there, and that's where the gymnasium was up top, and then uh, some other facilities on the bottom. Yeah, we're just talking about Cactus Drive, Beatrice Avenue, and across the river, you can see from the river where Montevideo Highway would sit. We could sit in school and look down over the hill you know, at uh, the river and so forth, but uh, that's just an aerial view right there. A couple of years ago, uh, we and the, the delegates from Montevideo County uh, decided to put a sign there to indicate why the building was first put, uh, you know, erected. And uh, that's what we did. And then I took this shot here of the uh, cornerstone. Uh, we had some conflicting dates on when the school was put up because uh, we talked about when it was dedicated and some things didn't go together. So I thought, well, I'll take the shot over there because I remembered always. But when I would go to school there, when I was in seventh grade, and I thought, 19 through foot. That building's been there forever. <laughs> but, and then when the school closed, I thought, they didn't even use it 20 years because the school closed in uh, 54. The school, you know, so I thought, oh my, except when you're, when you're younger, you think five years is forever. <laughs> <coughs> and of course, Elder Roosevelt came. <laughs> it's this is Dory Fox at Edwardsville. And uh, all of the, you know, it tells you all the schools closed so everybody could go over there. But evidently, Doy didn't close his school because uh, in the article that I read, he said that uh, he was inside and he heard a noise out. He opened the door and there was Mrs. Roosevelt coming in with two little girls by, but leading her by with the hand. And this is the a copy of the program that was used for the dedication. And this is really a good. Um, I, I think sometimes maybe we should uh, make a copy of this statement that was in, the, in that program. It was great. A few years ago, maybe the last high school reunion that we had, we made copies of that, and that was the cover of the program for the last reunion that we had for Montgomery High School. So some of those, and some of the original ones are still floating around. But this article here was really good. Um, and then when they talked about with the completion of the athletic field, now under construction, the high school, the first Negro high school in the state to boost of such an accomplishment. Well, they never did finish it. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a, a program on the inside. And of course, at that time with the black high school, I mean with the black schools, you also had a uh, African-American uh, supervisor, state supervisor, and uh, I guess we always would read about uh, I.J.K. Wells, superintendent of Negro Schools. So everything had their own, probably not the same pay, but we had someone in charge of it. And this was um, Mrs. Roosevelt's uh, article that she wrote after she had been to Morgan County. And I understand, of course, she came here many, many times. And this here is um, a page out of our first um, booklet that we had for our reunion. And when I first heard that Catherine Coleman taught at uh, Montgomery High, I went to this book. And I thought, well, how did they miss her name? Why did they put it in here? But I'm looking for Catherine Johnson. And then all of a sudden, it's like a light bulb came on. I thought she wasn't married that guy. Or if she was married, she didn't let me know. And so they, this is a list that uh, someone has all the individuals who ever taught him on during high school. And there she is. Um, you know, the Hinshaw, like maybe I did before, she um, was, her family 
we're from Morgantown, and she still has relatives here, descendants here, and uh, I never did have her in school, but I always heard that she was such a tough, tough uh, English teacher. They said she was anybody, if you wanted to do very well at English or get that, you wanted to have her as an instructor. And Grace Edwards Waters, probably how many in here had Mrs. Waters? Yeah, yeah. She was, oh my, she was quite a lady. And, uh, well, I don't know. I have, as a matter of fact, I didn't think about today to bring, I had it at the other, uh, when I did this in, no, in November, she, I have a large bell, and I should have brought it with me today that she gave me. And she told me, probably just a few years before she passed, that that bell was something, was a bell that her grandmother used when she taught in a one-room school. And I had a collection of bells, and she said, I don't know if anybody that I want to see have this more than you. And that was from Miss Grace Edwards Waters. But most anybody that knew her knew she was a dynamic lady. This is the um, high school, the football team that won the state championship in 1940. I see Karen Sue Cranford there. Her dad is the only, as far as we know, the only surviving member, he's right there, <laughs> the only surviving member of this team. I went out to see them uh, Thursday and I have the football, the trophy, that they won for uh, winning that championship. So. Uh, there's a few people on there that I can remember, and he and my cousin right here, they were just the best of buddies. And um, my cousin passed away probably two years ago, but those were, they, they were just buddies. So it's just hard to think that uh, so many of them that he is, as far as we know, the only surviving member of that team. And he wanted to get that trophy back so bad, uh, and it had, when they, closed the school, they took all of the trophies from Montgomery High and they evidently distributed them through a lot of the, uh, the white schools throughout the area. And I had several people who had complained to me because at Morgantown High, they had these flags hanging up and they had what year they were champs. And they had one up there for 1940, but they were state champs. And one guy told me, he says, I keep up with everything. I didn't know, because I'm not much of a sport fan, but he said, they're claiming that victory from that when that was a black school. So I talked to the superintendent schools and I got the trophy and it's out here today. Wow. Uh, this choir director, uh, Eugene Jones, and I didn't really know Mr. Jones, but he had to know it was quite a good character and uh, was so strict with the choir. And this is the choir under his direction that went to the White House to sing for President Roosevelt. Mm. And uh, I think I read someplace that that was the only time uh, President Roosevelt ever asked for an encore. Mm. And I think one of his favorites was St. Louis Blues. But I can just, just barely remember once when they were having a uh, fundraiser and of course, uh, those of you who've ever been in those days, you probably wouldn't know that now. There was a theater there, and one of their fundraisers, they came out and they did a production there at the theater for, for that. Uh, and uh, I guess they just danced, and, but they were just quite, so Eugene Jones was the choir director there, and I understand he was originally from uh, Moundsville, West Virginia, and then later he, of course, got a good uh, promotion of a job in uh, Philadelphia. So uh, that was Eugene James. And then the choir here. This is the choir that went to the uh, White House. And they traveled, I guess, extensively one spring. And there were several articles in the Morgantown paper uh, about them <coughs> and, and their travels. Uh, a few of them I could recognize just from, I just know who they are, I remember them so um but probably the only person I think that still lives in this area is Wanda Mouse Spencer. And uh, I think she lives out of Brookhaven now. But evidently that they were just, you know, a, a dynamic choir. <coughs> this gentleman here is Charles Johnson. Mm -hmm. And Charles was a band director for Ronnie Yoya High School. 
and he just wanted those kids to have a, uh, a band, and, and uh, the students were very much excited about it. And I told everyone, I said, the thing that was so unique about the band director at Monville is high, most places you have a, somebody who has a degree in music, and of course, we were lacking so many things at Montgomery High, we did not have that privilege of having a band. He was also the janitor. Oh, oh my goodness. And he took upon himself to teach those students to, we just, it was drum and bugle. And then he would, you know, would do the choreography, he taught the, the steps and so forth. And then the people around, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Mrs. Clarkson, uh, the wife of Mr. Roscoe Clarkson, she, uh, the people would take up money, you know, contributions, raise money, get the material, make the uniforms, and when you see a picture of the band and you'll see some out front, Mrs. Clarkson made those original oh outfits for them. And when those students came down High Street, sometimes if somebody was late for the band, they would say, did Bond get you high? Or some of them might say, did the black kids go by? Yeah, because everybody waited to see them and the Matrix. That was Charlie Johnson, and this was some of the first band members. This here, uh, and, and probably some of you will probably remember Reverend Morgan, but uh, Mary Morgan was the uh, drum major for a long time, and then after out of high school, she became a minister. <coughs> but uh, she was just good, you know, with her marching and so forth. <coughs> Well, it seems like I was, all, I didn't realize it for a long time that I'm always getting involved in something. So it, uh, at, what, at the Montgomery High School, we would raise money for different things for the athletic department. So we had this program called Sweet Comes to Morgantown, and if you see it's a music and dance fundraiser. And uh, Governor Patterson's daughter was coming to crown us, and we were so excited. So you had to raise money to be that queen. Well, I didn't raise enough. I wasn't queen. <laughs> so when we did this, we put names. I told them, well, put names on everybody, but I'll just see if anybody. I said, of course, that was, I don't know, 65 pounds ago and 60 years ago. <laughs> but that was me. <laughs> and um, the other ladies, you know, and again, sadly to say, the young lady on the end, Drakeford, she lives in uh, Atlanta. I'm in Morgantown, and the other three are deceased. But that was our, and we had a big, a big dance, and it, it, it was just, it was a good, good, good um, <coughs> time. Thank you. Again, again, we have raised money for athletic department, and um, there I am again. Uh, and I was, and I said, I look like I was scared to death. But also, what we did for the state basketball tournament, each school would have a miss. Again, we had to raise money for that. And um, so I became Miss Monongalia High. And the lady on the far end was uh, from Kelly Miller. And I can remember what most of them were from, except the late last two over here. And one of them, I'm still in contact with her today after 60 some years. But uh, that was, and this picture was taken uh, at uh, Western State College, and um, Montgomery High and Kelly Miller were always such strong rivals. And the that particular year, the state uh, basketball tournament, the regional basketball tournament, was held here in at Westover at Montgomery High School, and Montgomery High and Kelly Miller High went down to the wire. They played for the regional championships, Montgomery High won, and it would all ended up going to the state championship together from the schools, black schools all over the state, and Montgomery High and Kelly Miller High ended up playing for the state championship, and Montgomery High won. But we were, that was just the rivals there. <laughs> so this just gives you a list of the principals that we had at, at uh, Montgomery High, and some of them were that they came from. So, uh, as you see, we had quite a turnover. And um, it was 
the William Jones at the bottom, he was from Clarksburg, and uh, Mr. Glover was, well, he had taught at Douglas High School in Huntington, <coughs> and uh, J. Douglas Anderson from Bluefield. At the time, they would recruit people from all over the state to come to Bordecai, and the teachers would, would be recruited from all over to come here, and then they would stay with families right here. Uh, we're still in contact with uh, my home ec teacher that I had back in the 50s, and she lives in um, Philadelphia. Wow. And uh, she has been here in the last four or five years, and she's still going strong. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, after the schools were integrated, this is gives you a list of only nine African American teachers that were hired uh, for these the integrated schools. The others were just out. And it was a sad time because the last um, coach at Longhead High School, and he was uh, had a master's in physical education, and uh, he was not hired for anything. And until he could get his family together and move with a master's degree, he became a bellhop at Morgan at Mo uh, Hotel Morgan. Mm -hmm. And then some of his friends told him, you need to come to Rochester, and I know you'll get a job. His wife, who was an excellent typist and so forth, she couldn't find a job either. So he went to Rochester. He was hired by Rochester Board of Education, and he recruited teachers for them until he retired two years ago. And his wife, shortly after she called me, she said, Charlene, I have a job. And she, she became an executive with Xerox <laughs> in no time. <laughs> the teacher here, Mrs. Payton, and maybe some in here may have had Mrs. Payton, I don't know. But this was just a shot of some things that they did at a, a book event. And Miss Payton was well loved throughout the area. And this is another shot of. Uh, Montgomery High School, and uh, it became after, for a few years, I think it was David, and then the, uh, they made it Westover Elementary School, mm -hmm. and at one time it may have been even elementary, uh, Westover Junior High, and now it has uh, just the office spaces are in there. So that must be quite a bit of a space for the office, but they still have this excellent uh, gymnasium there. This shot here, I took this while I was at high school, and the lady here, this is Annette Chandler, and this was Mr. Hunt's granddaughter. <coughs> Annette was, uh, she was very, very bright, and uh, she's the one that I told you became the first female African American to graduate at WVU after integration. Annette graduated at WVU, and then she went to um, Chicago and worked at Cook, for Cook County for a number of years, and then she moved right outside of Chicago, and that's where she passed away a few years ago. That is the book, and Ron is familiar with that, the cover of our uh, high school reunion book, the one at our first high school reunion in 1973. And that's where some of these are. So, I don't know that anybody, you may not want to see this part, this one is <laughs> The other part was like, when we put this together, Barb House said, Charlie, you need to include stuff about yourself. And I said, I don't think we need to include anything about me. And, um, but, and with Barb, I said, she would, I told her, I said, I don't want to talk about myself. So she put this in and then she did this next part. I had nothing to do with that. And this part here shows those of you who've been around Morgan Town for a while, you may know where the flame was and now, mm -hmm. and after a while, it the Cape Cafe Rockets. But um, for, uh, to talk about segregation and so forth, um, we went there one time for a meal with some people who were members, who had an appointment, uh, and uh, we, or we made reser they made reservations, and they didn't want to admit us. And so I had to deal with them to threaten to sue before they would break the break down their discrimination policies. So that's my husband and I, and this was to Dr. Um, Peterson and her husband, Dr. Virgil Peterson. And they were some of the people who helped us in breaking down discrimination in Montegalia County, not only for restaurants, but for um, hotels and stuff, we had a group, and that's how we began to break down the uh, discrimination. And then this is where I 
work after after many years of struggling fossils and I work with the IT office at Monday. And I don't even know if we need to go this far or not, but <laughs> this was some of the um, my union activities and uh, when I went to work with Struggling Fossil, I became a store worker and then I went to university with Luna. So I I've, I've just done, you know. As I said before, I didn't realize and so a few years ago, about 17 years ago, we were getting ready to move, and I found a little medallion. And I thought, oh, it's been years since I've seen this. And it was a medallion that I got when I graduated high school from being the senior that participated in the most activities. So, <laughs> so these, uh, this is some of the things that I had worked for public service, and some of the things that I had been involved with with the NAACP and the Red Cross and all of these, and then Bart wanted to include some of um, my awards. Oh, City Council. How could I forget that? Um, <laughs> um, hmm. So she wanted, of course, to include a picture of City Hall and the fact that I was the first American, African American woman mayor in West Virginia and the first African American to serve on City Council. And this one, um, and this one always sort of gives me a little bit of cold chills because um, when we had part of the money to purchase the Metropolitan Theater, um, we had to check, and as Chief Elected Officer in the city of Morgantown, I was to take that over, and uh, I think we, and then there'll be another photo after this. As we were on the stage getting ready to take care of that part of the business, um, this we made from our uh, pictures in the paper. They did, the building had been closed for years and they just cleared off the table enough for um, Mr. Gagel, Mr. Comanzi and myself and members of the committee to be there. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, I think I've got cold chills. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here today with the check to buy the place. And as this little black girl from Osage Years ago, I had to sit up in the balcony. Mm -hmm. I thought now today I got to check the box. So I always, uh, when I see that photo, and I don't think anybody else on that stage, uh, of course they couldn't have known what I was thinking, and I just shared that with some of the others. And that's what. Then of course I went to the House of Delegates for 14 years. And that was quite an experience also. Imagine. <laughs> 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 so, uh, and then um, Barbara wanted to include some of my awards and honors from, and I was always so privileged to get those from West Virginia Education Association, Mountain State Bar, and from the FBI. You earned them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but I want to thank you all for coming out today. Yeah, um, they had some more photos out there of different things around uh, Morgantown from the high school and so forth. Uh, the football, the, the trophy is out there. Uh, oh, and then uh, 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 Debbie Robinson brought down the original charter. Questions? Oh, yes, okay. I have one. Okay. <laughs> 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 I have one. I want to make sure I got the dates right. The, the integration occurred here when? Was 54. It 54. Yeah. I find that amazing. Well, and the reason being, okay. uh, I grew up in Florida, Jim Crow South, 70 yeah. years old, I will be short. I graduated from high school in 66. Not sure when the legislation was passed, but it, 54. It, it, May of 54. Well, in Florida, I went to an all-black high school, in, and I graduated in 1966. Hmm. West Virginia wow. sort of noted for happening yeah. quickly. Yeah. You know, uh, so, you're, and, and I'm trying to understand. You know, yeah. first of all, I wish Florida had followed that lead. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But, but of course I, they didn't. The, one, the way that I usually explain it <laughs> here in this area, we had such small classes by that time, mm -hmm. about 54. A lot of the coal mines, like there used to be 
It's unbelievable the number of African Americans that live, say, uh, in Edwardsville. And different. so the coal mines was going down, people were leaving, and we didn't have uh, very many African Americans. Um, so we, they could, the, the kids were either going to go to University High or Morgantown High. The legislation was passed in May of 54. That fall, you just knew you were going to school in the area you lived in, in this county. But when you get down to the southern part of the state and the southern part of West Virginia, uh, down around Gary and all of those places, they had such large populations that they did not have the ability to integrate that, that you know, that year. Uh, I remember going to the Phil House one year when um, state tournament was here in Morgan. Probably the last time it was ever here, and it was at the old Phil House. And I told my husband, I said, now, I don't usually go to a lot of games. I said, I've got to go. I went to Bluefield to school, and I said, my best friend at Bluefield, Gary, was her high school, and I'm just going to go and see them out and tell her that. And I go down, and here's all of these black people that had come in for this tournament. And I thought, gee, I don't think I know any of them. So I'm sitting there, and I heard somebody say, Charlene. And I thought it must be somebody else named Charlene. They said, Charlene Jennings. And I turned around, and there was my friend from Bluefield. Huh? And her and Gary was, uh, I, I, don't, I know they won a tournament that year, but they were so great. But they could not integrate because th th there were just too many kids. And then gradually they worked in. Uh, but I don't know of any place in West Virginia that they really had a big problem when it came to integration. But that's a good question, Tom. Yes, yeah. Charlene, I wanted to mention that we printed out a copy of, of a booklet that was produced by Charlene um, Jackson Vaughn's church. And they, they sponsored her Wilberforce scholarship. Yeah. And they sold these booklets. And it's a, quite extensive, and it has a wonderful picture of her. Of course, she went to, gra to Wilberforce and then to graduate school here, and then became one of the computers for NASA. She's, she's part of that group uh, in uh, uh, Hidden Figures. Yeah. And it's, it's laying out here on a calendar. I just want okay. you to know that okay. you have a printed copy. Thank you. It's well worth the reading. <laughs> yes. Yes. You mentioned Rochester. Uh, I'm from Rochester, by the oh. way. <laughs> and I'm just curious, when you were a little girl in the school system, um, Today they have Black History Month, Black History Week, and so forth. Obviously, that didn't didn't have something like that, like they like they do now. Um, my my question is, what? How did they teach African American history when you were young? Did you did they did you learn about Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington? Right, Frederick. Some of the ones that our teachers that we, we would get the lessons up. Um, a book with Jim Washington, George Washington Carver, and to me, I guess I always thought George Washington Carver was the only African American that ever did much of anything. <laughs> because we would, read, we would study about him every year. So uh, there was not as extensive as it is today, but, uh, but our, but see, we had the black teachers, and that's what they, they taught us that. And they were very strict. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, um, we had, um, say for instance, I knew this one teacher and I thought, I don't ever want to do, I, I could get in trouble if I did something at home. I mean, my mother was very strict. Um, but some of the kids, if they did something on the weekend and somebody went back to school and told that teacher, she didn't have it. <laughs> yeah, she straightened them out. And of course, my mother was, I, I, I didn't tell you guys, I got, uh, my father was killed in mines out of Osage when I was five years old. My mother had five kids and she was expecting another one. And then, five years later, she married again. And we had one more little sister. And when my stepfather, when my little sister was four years old, my stepfather was killed in mines. And so they were killed at, oh, my father was killed at Osage, my stepfather was killed out there on the old Fairmont Road where that mines is. But then my mother's father had been killed in the mines when she was little. So uh, she was 
very, very strict. So, um, but we, we learned a lot about uh, from, the, from those teachers. And as I said before, the one teacher that we had, she had taught my mother. So, uh, you, can, you, didn't, you didn't get away with anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to say a couple things. I went to grade school first, where I was after integration. So, you know, um, there were African Americans in our school, and we just all played together. And I played basketball against a lot of African Americans. I made some great relationships with uh, African American people. And uh, I wanted to let you know that, you know, we want to collect as much as we can. Uh, to the museum, and uh, we have deeds of gifts that you can uh, give us or loans. And I also wanted to say I played uh, basketball, and my greatest experience is I played basketball with Dwayne Lewis, who lived on White Avenue yeah. in the old school. That's when we were in junior high. Mm -hmm. And so I would go over in that house. And I also had a relationship with Mr. Edwards, who moved from that <laughs> house on down the street. And I cherish those memories, and uh, we also had uh, Mr. Cranford in our, uh, what was it, Pam? That raised in our parade. Uh, uh, it was the hometown team uh, hometown yeah, in 2014, yeah, a Smithsonian oh, exhibit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, just some great relationships, and, uh, you know, I, I just want you to, um, you can either put things on loan, or, but we need to get our collection. Uh, more, more thanks. Thanks. Um, how did your mother or other um, widows um, of, of the mines, uh, how did they then get by? Get how did they, well, how did they scrounge or how did they, uh, well, because well, your house was connected to mining, right? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, and to this day, I don't know how we were able to remain in that house, but we did. And of course, my mother had to get a job. So then, when my the child that she was carrying, my sister, she lives in New Jersey now. Uh, my grandmother raised her, and my mother had to get a job. But I always tell people, I said, I have three kids, and everybody in my family, everybody at that time, when I was growing up, everybody had a job. My oldest sister did um, most of the cleaning, and another sister did a lot of the cooking. Well, I was the one that had to cut the wood and carry the coal. <laughs> and I always say, to this day, I've got Gwendolyn, Junior, and Rocky, and they're all in their 60s, and I was like, if I thought one of them had to use an axe right now, I'd die. <laughs> <laughs> I could do it when I was six and seven. <laughs> but it's, it's what you're used to and what you grew up with, you know, but we all had chores to do. And uh, we just did it. <laughs> but, but she had a job. <laughs>